Arithmetic coding sure sounds interesting, and also useful, but if our goal is to actually write a compression scheme in the form of a computer program, we have a bit of a problem, which is that arithmetic coding seems to rely on the properties of real numbers, which theoretically at least have an infinite number of decimal places. And it seems like if we analyze the algorithm that we developed in the last lecture for arithmetic coding, it relies pretty heavily on being able to work with real numbers that have some arbitrary number of decimal places. And the reason that that's a problem for us is that our computer's memory only has a finite amount of space. So we're stuck in the sort of awkward position of needing to achieve infinite precision using a finite number of bits. So what are we going to do about that? Well, first, sorry about the clickbait title, but that's not possible. I mean, come on, you, you can't store an infinite amount of information in an arbitrary sense using a finite number of bits. That is impossible. Which means if we want to implement arithmetic coding on a computer, we're going to have to make some form of compromise. And the point of this lecture is to show off that yes, such a compromise is possible, and also that we can make compromises that don't compromise the correctness of the algorithm. So we can still actually perform encoding and decoding losslessly. The compromises that we make will therefore have to affect compression efficiency. So we're not going to achieve the ideal compression that we saw arithmetic coding at least is theoretically capable of in the last lecture. But we will still have correctness, and hopefully the compromises that we make only sacrifice compression efficiency to an extent that, we, that is practical and therefore still allows arithmetic coding to uh, outperform other methods. So, for example, um, to outperform Huffman coding on those cases where Huffman coding doesn't seem to be very good. And one other note that I should make is that we are allowed inside of a computer to consider infinite representations. We just can't represent the entire infinite set of possibilities. So, for example, I am allowed to, uh, in a computer model some kind of real number that has an infinite number of decimal places. For example, I could say, I'm going to give you five digits of my choice, and then every digit after that fifth digit, I will assume is the number seven. Well, in that case, I suppose I've described an infinite decimal expansion. But of course, I can't just set any of this infinite number of extra digits to whatever value I want. I have to choose some digit because that way I'm only using a finite amount of space. It's because of an agreement between you and I that we're able to interpret this as an infinite expansion. And in fact, we do this. Um, so for example, I could take this number here, which is an approximation of 1 over 3 in base 10. And I could say something like, hey, if I give you a sequence of decimal digits, after the last digit, assume that the number is followed by an infinite number of copies of that last digit. If I did this, it would allow me to represent 0 0.3 repeating, so 1 over 3, faithfully in base 10, without actually storing an infinite number of digits. I'm allowed to do that. What I'm not allowed to do is actually provide you an infinite number of arbitrary digits. For example, I couldn't provide every single digit in base 10 of an expansion of pi. That wouldn't make any sense. That's our problem. It does look as if arithmetic coding is general enough that it requires that. It requires me to perform arithmetic in some base, whether that be base 10 or whether it be base 2, and we know that if we perform arithmetic in a particular base and we perform division that doesn't um, that is relatively prime to the, the base, so for example, if I try and store the value one third in base 10 or in base 2, I'm going to end up with some you know long decimal expansion, some infinite expansion um, of my fractional representation. Uh, and if I keep doing that, if I keep multiplying by one third uh, or um, one seventh or something, I'm going to get this strange arbitrary number where if I start cutting it off at some specific specific number of decimal places, I will actually be losing information. So we have to make some form of compromise. Uh, and so arithmetic coding relies on these properties of real numbers, and in general, real numbers have, if we view them as having a decimal expansion, an infinite number of decimal places. And arithmetic coding, as we saw in the last lecture, does seem to be able to leverage those properties with great effect. The problem is, what are we supposed to do if we implement this in a computer? Um, and so we know that the values low and high, so the main operation of the algorithm works on these two values low and high, which describe the current range of probability values. And then we, we later, at the end of the encoding process, we choose some representative, some convenient representative between low and high um, as what we send to the decompressor, as what we actually take to be our encoded bitstream.
Uh, so after we perform one step of encoding, we notice uh, in this example here, we're encoding the letter A. Its probability range is 0 through 0.33. So the values of low and high, if we think of these as exact values, the values of low and high are 0 and 1 over 3. Um, and we know even in the last lecture, for the sake of representing these things, if I have to actually draw a bit sequence on the slide, I can't, my slides don't have infinite width because YouTube doesn't support that yet. Uh, and so, of course, I'm truncating the value 1 over 3 here. But notice, of course, that the value 1 over 3 in base 2 does repeat forever. It, it's it's um, in base 2, 1 over 3 is equal to 0 0.01 all repeating. So an infinite sequence of 0, 1. Uh, and that means that if I truncate it, there is going to be some form of truncation error. Now, actually, that's fine. Of all the compromises we have to make today, that is the easiest one to make. Even in the last lecture, we were doing that and everything was still working. The numbers on the slides that I was showing were being truncated and that truncation propagated through and yet somehow we were able to do encoding and decoding. So the truncation isn't actually a problem. Of course, as I'm sure you know, if we're going to choose a fractional representation that gets truncated after some number of bits or some number of significant bits or anything else, we need to make sure we keep enough bits around that we have enough precision to differentiate between all of our possible cases. In other words, basically what I want at a very, very high level, what I need is enough bits that every step of my computation, so for example, steps involving a probability or steps involving the values of low and high or whatever, um, ensure that we maintain our invariant that low is less than high. If low ends up equaling high, the reason that that should happen, assuming we have a well-defined system of probabilities and whatever, so symbols have probability greater than zero. The only reason this should ever occur in practice is if my numerical representation doesn't give me enough precision. I don't want this to happen because my encoder would break at that point. I need low and high to have some distance between them so that I can continue making progress. And we understand that truncation can't be that bad because we actually perform truncation ourselves. Once we're done with our encoding, we've got this range low high, we choose some value in the middle and we truncate it down as we see to be convenient. Like we actually deliberately truncate because we don't want to send any more bits than necessary to the decompressor. Um, and of course, we should observe that if I use truncation when I'm storing my numbers and then I reuse those numbers again at the next step, any error introduced by the truncation propagates in, and that introduces compounding errors into the computation. Now, when I talk about errors in this context, they're not necessarily errors that affect the correctness of the algorithm. So if I'm looking at the number um, 0.2 repeating, and I only am able to represent it, let's use base 10 for the sake of the example, I'm only able to represent four decimal places, well then I suppose I might have to agree that maybe the number is 0.2 followed by an infinite sequence of zeros. So I only have four zero point, I've got 0 0.2222 and then a bunch of zeros. Even if the goal was actually, the number I wanted to represent was 0.2 repeating, I couldn't do that. The truncation error eliminated that infinite expansion of twos. Um, and so obviously that error is going to pile up. If I now multiply this value by something else, then of course the error introduced here is going to be magnified over time. It's going to compound over time. That's a problem. But on the other hand, really it's only a problem in terms of compression efficiency. So if I consider the fact that um, uh, this represents as 0.33, and I don't necessarily know if I use two decimal places whether that's 0.33 and then a bunch of infinite threes, or whether it's 0.337 or 0.331 or whatever because of my truncation, then all that's really happening is the range of probabilities that I'm assigning to A is a little bit different than it should be. We, we saw in the last lecture that ideally we would like the range of prob the range of, um, of the interval assigned to A to exactly match its true probability. And if we truncate that probability, then we'll be introducing a certain amount of inefficiency into our computation. But we also know that if we use prefix coding, there's going to be that inefficiency as well. And it doesn't affect the correctness of the algorithm, just the compression efficiency. So if A ends up with a range of probabilities that differs a little bit from its true probability, that's not ideal, but not for a correctness, um, not from a correctness standpoint, just from an efficiency standpoint. And as usual, we're going to have uh, efficiency issues implementing any compression scheme that relies on real numbers. Ideally, um, if we choose choose enough significant digits, if we have enough precision, then any uh, compression efficiency issue resulting from truncating will be relatively minor. And I can put up with that. I can lose a few bits here or there if in exchange I'm actually able to implement my uh, encoding scheme. So the key thing to observe here is that if we perform truncation, yes, there are going to be truncation errors. And yes, those errors are going to pile up between steps. 
On the other hand, we already saw in the last lecture that if we do truncation way down in some distant decimal or, or uh, binary place, maybe it's not such a big deal. So if we maintain a huge number of significant bits, the impact of a truncation error will be relatively minor. And moreover, we can control the impact of truncation errors. If I control how many significant bits I have on hand at any given time, I can just make sure I choose a number that's large enough for the truncation error to be relatively negligible, to be small enough that I don't need to worry about it too much. So in any event, I'm going to need to perform truncation one way or the other. It's not the only compromise I have to make. The properties of arithmetic coding, in particular the fact that as I keep encoding characters from left to right, I seem to need more and more bits to represent my values. That ultimately is the thing we're going to have to worry the most about. Um, performing truncation, only having a certain number of significant digits, isn't the end of the world. We can put up with the small incremental errors introduced by that truncation because we're still in control. We can still choose a number of bits that, that relegates those errors to a relatively minor place. Um, I, I do, however, want to observe that we still have to choose a number of significant bits. If we really want to be uh, cheap, if we want to choose the, the smallest number of bits possible, we can actually begin to derive some logic for how many bits that we need. So again, our, our goal here is we don't have a correctness problem as long as we have enough precision to differentiate between all possible symbols. As long as not only is there space between low and high, there's enough space between low and high that I can split up, I can divide up the interval that I have left over among all the possible symbols if needed. So that no matter what the next symbol is, there is going to be enough space um, to represent the new range, the new value of low and the new value of high without those being equal to each other. Um, in other words, what I basically want is if I consider any possible symbol, so I don't, suppose I don't yet know what symbol I'm going to encode next. I know that um, I'm going to compute my new low and my new high value. And of course, in the actual algorithm, we just call these low and high. But uh, I'll, for the sake of differentiating here, we'll, we'll refer to the new value and the old value in this slide. Um, I'm going to compute my new low and my new high value based on the cumulative probability of the symbol that I'm currently working on. What I need is uh, based on no matter what the current values of high and low are, because they impact this formula, no matter what the current values of high and low are, I need it to be the case that no matter what symbol I'm encoding next, the range I compute, new low and new high, is still open enough, like I still have enough space between new low and new high that I can continue encoding. In other words, what I want is for for the updated ranges, new low and new high, to be distinct from each other. Because if not, then I have this problem of encoding two symbols into the same range, uh, and that then the algorithm loses correctness. Um, if I engineer these equations a little bit, I can, I can try and figure out what I really mean by that, for all the ranges to be distinct. Um, one thing I can observe is I can actually stop worrying about C high, because C high of SI is actually equal to C low of um, SI plus 1 based on the idea that what I've done is I've taken my interval and I've divided it up into pieces. And if this is the piece for A, the high end for A is also the low end for B. We saw that in the last lecture. So I can eliminate C high, and therefore I can rewrite this in terms of just C low. So that is, it's a bunch of equations of the form low plus high minus low times C low of something. If I now extend that to every possible symbol, what I really end up with is, uh, given any particular high and low that I'm starting with, what I want is the new bounds that I compute, both the highs and the lows, to all be distinct. In other words, I basically want this stack of different equations to all evaluate to different things at every step. Because if any two of these evaluate to the same thing, what I've done is conflated two symbols together, which of course isn't allowed, because then I, I can't decompress. That, then I have ambiguity in my process. So I need enough precision that for each of my symbols, based on their probabilities, which of course depends on the probability distribution that I'm working with, for each of my symbols, all of these values are always distinct. Uh, and keep in mind that I, I can simplify and not worry about C high because of this relationship here. Um, if I boil that down further, and I observe that, of course, once I've decided the ranking of my symbols, once I've decided which symbol is the first symbol, which symbol is the second, really what I'm stating is a long chain of inequalities. For there to be space between these these two things, keeping in mind that this will be a smaller value than this, what I'm really stating, the relationship I want, is just that if I look at this stack of equations, each thing is less than the thing in front of it. That's it. I just want that to be a stack of strict inequalities. I don't want there to be anything that's equal among this stack. And so if I think about that, really what I'm saying is for every symbol, um, for every symbol index i, I have this. 
And I can even engineer it further. So if I wonder what this really means, I can simplify it down using the definitions we derived in the last lecture for what C low and C high mean. I can actually observe that what I'm really saying, if I, if I apply definitions over and over, is that I want this invariant. At every step, high minus low, so that is the range between high and low, multiplied by the probability of any particular symbol has to be greater than zero. And one thing you can observe about this simplification, so this equation never shows up in the algorithm, but in, in terms of real numbers, it's algebraically equivalent to this condition here. Um, if we stare at the condition on the bottom, what we're saying is basically that at every step, high minus low has to be greater than zero, and the probability of each symbol has to be greater than zero. And that's always true. If we're working in real numbers, in arbitrary real numbers, in conceptually, so with an infinite uh, amount of precision, this is always true. This is a requirement of our algorithm that always high will be greater than low and the probability of every symbol will be greater than zero because why do you have symbols in your table if their probability is zero? And moreover, even if you were allowed to put those symbols in there, so if you were allowed to have symbols with probability zero, you wouldn't need to worry about this because if the symbol has probability zero, it never occurs and you'll never need to encode it. So this this statement here is essentially a tautology. Given our definitions, given what we're working with, this is always going to be true with real numbers. But it won't necessarily always be true with some fixed precision representation. That's why we have to think about it. Now, it's also worth considering that algebraic simplification can affect numerical stability or numerical precision. So if we're going to make a statement about what we need in an algorithm, if we're using fixed precision, we should make it only in terms of the equations that actually show up in the algorithm, like this one. Uh, and so what I need is some representation where at every step, no matter what the value of high, and high minus low is, um, I, have, I, can, I can assert that always the new value of low and the new value of high will be separated. So the new value of low will always be less than the new value of high. I can, of course, assert this in advance. Once you give me the distribution of symbols and you tell me um, uh, how many bits I have, I can tell you whether or not this criteria is met. So that's a little bit of a loose condition because obviously we want to design an implementation that works for any probability distribution. But as we go forward in this lecture, I'll, I'll be able to uh, make this a bit more concrete. It turns out that by the end of the lecture, we'll actually know in advance what we need for this uh, scheme that we're going to implement to always work. What properties of our distribution need to always hold. As opposed to this, which is uh, a little bit shifty because this is saying once you give me the probabilities of symbols, I might be able to tell you whether your representation is good enough. And that's not, that's not great because I, I want to be able to encode symbols with any probability distribution as long as every symbol's probability is greater than zero. Uh, okay, so there's that. Now, it turns out really that knowing the number of bits to use isn't the main issue because once I've chosen some number of bits, it's pretty easy to verify or to describe the situations where my probability distribution will meet the requirements. So one thing I'm going to observe, just to throw this out there right now, is that what it's going to come down to is in my chosen representation, no matter how many bits I'm using, I need it to be the case that any probability of a symbol basically is greater than zero. In other words, I can't have symbols whose probability value is so tiny that I can't represent it in the number of bits I've chosen. That's a relatively easy thing to, to, to verify. Um, and I'll talk later about how it's actually even easier once we've, we've adapted a few of our definitions to the case of using fixed point arithmetic. So knowing how many bits to use isn't the issue. As long as I can choose some reasonable number of bits, which could be 16 bits or 32 or even 1,000, frankly, as long as, long as it's some fixed number of bits, uh, then that isn't actually the biggest issue. The issue is how I'm using those bits, and that's going to require us basically to design our own number system. So one thing we can reasonably assume is that although maybe in the ideal world, the thing we're comp we get an input sequence and a probability distribution that allows us to compress really, really well, in an ideal world, maybe we get great compression. But in general, we could be given an input that produces expansion. And if it produces expansion, that means we're using lots and lots of bits to encode our value. And so in the worst case, we can assume that as our input size goes up, the number of bits will increase linearly. Even if there's expansion, that's linear expansion. We haven't seen yet a case where we have um, an n symbol input, and for some reason we're producing n squared bits um, at, in, in the long term. So some family of inputs of size n where the output is always n squared, that would be pretty bad. That would be pretty nasty expansion. In general, as we've noticed, compression schemes, even uh, when there's gonna be expansion, they can control that expansion and keep it linear. So anyway, we can reasonably assume that as our input size goes up, the number of bits we require will increase linearly. Um, and the problem with that is that that means that as my sequence gets longer and longer, 
At every step, my entire sequence so far, all of my previously encoded characters, have been uh, captured by low and high. Somewhere between low and high, I am capturing all of the characters I've encoded so far. If the number of bits I need goes up linearly at each step, that means that the number of bits I need to represent low and high seem to also increase over time. I can't just set some number of bits and leave it. I seem to need more and more bits as time goes by. And worse, um, I have to perform arithmetic operations on low and high. So if low and high end up requiring millions of bits, performing arithmetic on low and high is going to be pretty nasty. It's going to require a very long time. Not to speak of the fact that, you know, typical floating point or fixed point arithmetic I do in a computer is based on a fixed amount of precision. If I would like to perform variable precision arithmetic, so arbitrary precision, and allow low and high to grow as time goes by, I may have to write my own algorithms for multiplication and addition. And I, I sort of think that's, as much as I want to give an entire lecture on that, I think that's a little bit out of scope for this course. So even if we can work out the number of bits we need, we don't have the ability to perform floating point or real valued arithmetic with millions or billions of bits. Not only can I not store them, because ultimately over time my streaming requirement is not going to be met. If you give me a long enough input, I cannot store the entire contents of low and high in memory. And even when I can, eventually they get long enough that I can't perform the multiplications or additions because they're going to take forever. They're going to get longer and longer at each step, keeping in mind that the um, number of bits I'm storing in low and high is going to go up at each step. So one thing I can observe is that as arithmetic coding progresses, and you may have seen this sort of this red prefix growing as I step through the, the steps of this algorithm, as arithmetic coding goes forward, the leading bits of low and high are going to match up to each other. So we know that over time, low and high are actually approaching each other. They're always getting closer together. They're never getting further apart. And that means that over time, as they get closer together, as I observed in the base 10 case in the last lecture, I should expect that they're going to develop this common prefix of bits. Um, and in general, I would like to be able to claim that if low and high have a common prefix of q bits at the beginning of this step, they will have a common prefix of at least q bits at the beginning of the next step. Over time, in the, in the broad sense, the common prefix will grow. It'll get, it'll get longer and longer. I can't guarantee that it'll grow uniformly. So there could be a long sequence of steps where it doesn't grow, but over time, I claim it will always grow. And in general, the law I want to state is, if there is a common prefix now, the same common prefix will exist at the beginning of the next step. Now, if we step through a few steps of this algorithm, so observe that right now the common prefix ends with 10101. Let's encode a few more characters. Okay, so I encode a few more characters. Notice that as I keep encoding here, um, I've now encoded several more characters. I started just after I finished encoding this space. And if I keep walking until I hit this A, notice that the common prefix hasn't increased in length. So the common prefix does not necessarily grow at every step, nor does it grow uniformly. Um, if I keep going though, eventually the common prefix will grow and it never gets smaller. So after I encode the D, the common prefix is now this big. Notice that huge jump. Huh. That's going to be a thing we have to talk about later in this lecture. But for now, the claim I want to make is once we have a common prefix up to this point, um, there will be no future step that makes that common prefix smaller. One other thing we can put on the back burner until later is before I saw that jump, so if I walk backwards a bit and, I, and I, I walk through that sequence again, notice that although the common prefix does not increase in length, there is something sort of weird happening here. So the common prefix doesn't increase in length because the low has a zero and high has a one. But right after that zero and one, there's this peculiar block of ones in low and zeros in high. Uh, that's, a, that's a weird um, special case that we're going to have to come back to later. And then once that special case resolves, that whole block of ones turns into a block of ones in both, and then we get a common prefix. And the common prefix is now much larger. So the common prefix can jump in size, but it never gets smaller. Um, I need to justify this point to some extent. Maybe it's intuitive, but that shouldn't be enough. We should be able to justify it further. Um, so if this observation is correct, really what I'm, I'm building towards here is maybe if that's true, if everything to the left of, of this line isn't ever going to change again, maybe I don't need to store it. Notice that if I did have to store the common prefix, I'm in all kinds of trouble. First, I violate my streaming requirement because over time, if I have to store every single bit of low and high, I'm eventually going to run out of memory for huge encodings. 
but also um, I'm running into a bit of a bandwidth problem down here. If everything to the left is fixed, then the number of bits I have available for actual computation is, be is being reduced over time. If I know these bits will never change, I have less and less room to differentiate between different cases in the bits that are able to change. That's a problem. But on the other hand, if I can justify that these red bits will never change, maybe I don't need to store them at all. Maybe what I could do is represent my values, my lower and upper bounds, um, by breaking the different pieces of the lower and upper bound up uh, between the bits that I'm currently actually changing, the active bits, and this common prefix that will never change. In other words, I can get around the limitations of fixed precision by representing my numbers in more than one place. Some of the bits are stored in one place, this common prefix. Maybe I could store those somewhere that I'm never going to need to read them again, like sending them out to my compressed bits stream, and then some of the bits are bits I'm currently working with, bits that may actually change. Okay, so first, how do I justify this claim that the common prefix will never change? What it comes down to is the observation that the equations that we use to modify low and high are actually um, examples of something called a convex combination. And I'll make a few observations here. One of them is, I can, although it does, it's not obvious how these equations fit this form here, I can actually rewrite them in this form. So I'm going to write L, uh, low as L and high as H. If I rewrite them in this form, what I end up with is L plus, uh, I'm going to call this C, H times C minus L times C. And if I fiddle around a little bit with that, what I end up with is um, H times C plus L, or actually I'll do, uh, yeah, L times 1 minus C if I rewrite that further. And if I stare at this now, I realize that actually I could now set lambda to be equal to C, or if I wanted to, I could set lambda to be equal to 1 minus C. It doesn't make much of a difference. Um, and if I do that, then I am, it does look as if I have an equation in this form. This is called a convex combination, which they show up in lots of places. They have some nice theoretical properties that once we know we have a convex combination, we can employ. So to have a convex combination, you have to have these two endpoint values, x and y. In this case, they are the current high and the current low, h and l. And you have to have a value lambda in the range 0 through 1. If I take c or 1 minus c to be lambda, I do have that property because c is a cumulative probability, which means it's definitely between 0 and 1. Um, and so I do have what I need to call this a convex combination. The reason why I care about this is once I have my x and y, it happens to one property of convex combinations is any convex combination on x and y will always lie in the interval x, y. So I have to rearrange x and y here so that the smallest one comes first, but that's pretty easy to do. Um, and this guarantees me that these equations will absolutely unequivocally always move low and high closer together because they're convex combinations of the old low and high and convex combinations always lie in the interval you started with. So they will get closer together. That means if low and high currently have a common prefix, so if low and high both begin with this set of values, this set of bits, then every value between low and high has to also begin with these bits. So if I'm taking a convex combination of low and high, every convex combination of low and high must also have the common prefix. That's the missing link that I need. If the binary expansions of low and high have a common prefix, whatever bounds I compute at the next step using these equations here will also have that common prefix. So I now know the common prefix can never change. Once it, once it exists, it might get bigger, but once it exists, it will never get smaller smaller. All right, so we can combine those observations to produce an arithmetic coding implementation using fixed point arithmetic, not floating point. I still need to do a little bit of work to figure out how I'm representing these fractions. So I'm representing these fractions using sequences of bits. I have to explain how I'm uh, how I'm actually representing that. So that is, I'm storing a sequence of bits in some kind of variable. How am I performing arithmetic? If I'm not using floating point, I can't just use typical floating point operations, like the ones that are defined on type float or type double. I either have to write my own, or I have to give you a very good explanation of how I'm able to use, for example, integer arithmetic to achieve my goal. So let's take a look at, that. let's do a bit more housekeeping, and then I want to talk about the number system. So here I've got this sequence of characters from before. The smallest probability is 1 over 12, which happens to expand to this 
more or less. Um, this has actually been truncated down. Um, but notice how, of course, in my probability table all along, that's been truncated down even further. You know, this is making it seem like maybe storing things as fractional values, if we can avoid it, might not be such a good idea. If I were able to store this probability as just 1 over 12, a rational number, that might make my life a little bit easier. Sure, when I eventually represent it as a fraction, I have to truncate it, but why truncate it until I actually have to? Maybe when I multiply things by this probability, I don't perform truncation right away if I, if I use this fractional representation as opposed to actually truncating it in advance. In other words, why don't I stop representing my probabilities as expansions, so decimal expansions or binary expansions, but instead um, just represent frequencies? Frequencies are integers. So I build my frequency table. If I want a probability from a frequency, I can always just divide the frequency by the total frequency and, and compute the probability on the fly. So I'm going to argue that means I shouldn't store probabilities at all. I'll just store frequencies. If I ever need a probability, I'll compute it as needed. I'll compute it on the fly, hopefully um, pushing off any need to round stuff or truncate stuff into the future. Um, so what I'm going to do from now on in this integer-based, uh, this integer um, arithmetic coding algorithm is instead of storing probabilities, I'll still write them down here, but instead of storing them, I will just store frequencies and uh, I'll store a table of cumulative frequencies, not cumulative probabilities. If I want a cumulative probability, I can always recover that dynamically on the fly. So instead of C low and C high, I'm going to talk about CF low and CF high, cumulative frequencies, not cumulative probabilities. If I want the cumulative probability that goes with a particular cumulative frequency, all I do is take that cumulative frequency and divide it by the total frequency. In other words, um, it's actually always going to be this number. Um, this is the equivalent of 1.0 in my cumulative probability table. Or you could view it as the sum of all of these things. So everything in this row here, if I add them all up, I'm going to get the number 12, the total cumulative frequency. Um, and so I'll call that t in this lecture. So 4 over 12 is the cumulative probability going with this entry, but I'm going to store it as just 4. If I ever want the fractional value, I'll just go get that. I'll, I'll compute that on the fly as needed. Okay, that's one thing. That avoids doing any more truncation than I absolutely have to. It also uh, allows me to not think about how I represent the probabilities in my fixed point system. I'm going to need to represent fractional values somehow, but maybe if I keep everything um, that I can as integers or rational numbers, so pairs of integers, I'll have to worry about that, that problem of representing fractional values a little bit less. Okay, now the number system. So what I'm going to do, I'd like to store my low and high values as a sequence of bits. I mean, that is, I'd like low and high to be, you know, 0, 1, 1, 1, whatever, some sequence of bits. The problem is I'm not going to use floating point data for this. I'm not going to use float or double. There are a lot of reasons for this, one of which is I want to have tighter control over which bits go where than float or double would give me. And also because float and double have a very fixed precision that I can't ever change, even if I want to, and a lot of the bits in a float or a double are used for things that I don't care about. So for example, floats can be negative. Floats and doubles, because they're floating point, allow me to represent values in a huge range, whereas I'd only want values between literally 0 and 1. So I'm actually not using a lot of features of float and double if I use them. So I'm not going to use them. I would like my low and high to be represented in some sequence of bits. OK, but how do I store that? I guess I have to store this in an int. OK, so I've got six bits here. I have to store this in some sort of integer value. Now I have to begin answering some questions about how I am, about the relationship between the storage mechanism, so an int, and what I'm, the arithmetic that I'm actually doing. So that's this sequence. I think this is the least palatable part of the lecture for most people. So I'm going to represent low and high using two fixed width integer, and we'll read this to mean unsigned integer values. Um, if I use qubits to represent each, so if I store my fractional expansion in, let's say, an 8-bit value, that's not 8, there we go. Um, so here's my fractional expansion here then I will adopt the convention that the most significant bit of the integer representation is the first bit after the radix point. So that's the way that this is going to work. Uh, and the least significant bit of my integer representation is the furthest away from the radix point. What's sort of nice about this is if you think about the way fractions work, the most significant contributor to the magnitude of this number is indeed the most significant bit, the first one after the radix point. So I, I'm ranking my significant bits in the same order in my integer representation with the most significant being on the left as I would in my fractional representation. So that's the, that's, that's the, those are the ground rules. That's the first step. I don't have to do that, but I'm going to do that. 
Okay, so now I've got this problem of, um, if I actually, I, maybe I shouldn't have erased that. If I think about those eight bits, so one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. If I think about those eight bits that I was just working with, let's choose something that's really easy to deal with here. So one, one, zero, 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 zero. So my eight bits are this. Um, and uh, okay, so that's, that's uh, relatively easy to visualize as an int and as a fraction, but they're not the same. So if I think about this as an int, if I just think about these eight bits as an int, notice that's gonna be some large number. It's gonna be what, 192 or something like that. If I think of it as a fraction, it corresponds to the fractional value. Okay, well that's one half and that's one quarter. So this interpreted as a fraction is gonna correspond in base 10 to 0 0.75. So of course, the integer representation interpreted as an int and the fractional representation interpreted as this particular left to right bit sequence after the radix point are two separate things. I need some way of differentiating. I need, I need to make it clear when I'm talking about the bits and when I'm talking about the interpretation of the bits. So I'm going to adopt this convention down here. Um, I've, suppose I've chosen how many bits I'm using, and we'll call that Q. In this case, it's 8. Um, then uh, I have to differentiate between the integer representation of the bits and the fractional interpretation of the bits. The way I'm going to do that is I'm going to basically, when I talk about low and high, low and high are stored in integer values. They're represented as just arbitrary bit sequences. So I'm interpreting, if you think about what these bits mean, if you just tell me, tell me what the bits of low are, I'd say, well, that's 0, 1, 1, 0, or the integer 6. If you want me to tell you the fractional interpretation of that, I'm going to use this notation. So f r of low. f r of low is what happens if you take the bits of low and stick them after a radix point. Now to do that, you have to tell me how many bits are in low, so how many bits you've chosen to use. Um, this, under, this 4 here, this subscript 4, isn't going to make much of a difference. Just keep in mind that it is sensitive. The representation is sensitive to the width of the integer field. Um, if low were 0, 1, 1, 1, 0 stored in 8 bits, the fra fractional interpretation would be different than if low were stored in 4 bits. Okay, so whenever I talk about low and high, I'm talking about just the bit sequence, interpreted as an integer or not, just a bunch of bits in a row. If I want to talk about the fractional interpretation of that bit sequence, I will write fr of low. This isn't a function that does anything, it's just telling you to interpret the, the bit sequence a little bit differently. Okay, so now what I have to do is talk about the relationships between numbers in this numbering system. So one thing I will notice is if I would like to perform arithmetic, so let's look at two relatively simple fractions here. So we'll do uh, A equals um, the bit sequence. So again, I'm, when I write bit sequences, I'm not talking about the fraction just yet. A is the bit sequence 1, 0, 0, 0. Uh, and that means that the fractional interpretation in four bits of A is, well, 0 0.1000 in base 2, which equals 0 0.5. And I'll define B to be 0, 1, 0, 0. And the fractional interpretation of B in four bits is uh, 0 0.0100 uh, in base 2, which is 0 0.25. Okay, a couple of things to observe here. If I take a plus b, remember that a and b are ints. They are not in inherently fractional. So a plus b is actually going to be 1, 1, 0, 0. And if I think of the fractional interpretation of that, fractional interpretation of a plus b, so I perform the arithmetic before I interpret it as a fraction, well then in that case I get 0 0.1100, which actually does happen to equal um, 0 0.75, which actually also happens to equal what would happen if I... Uh, convert both things to fractions, and then add them together, so fr4 of b. So consider that. That's sort of convenient. If I use this way of interpreting a bit sequence as a fraction, and I choose to add together the bit sequences using integer arithmetic, then indeed it does turn out that it matches. It turns out that I could add, that if I add together the fractional component um, directly, I, I get the same thing. That's nice, but it's not always true. So if I try this again, let's again say a equals, um, we'll clear that up, we'll say a again equals 1,000 here, which means that the fractional interpretation of a, uh, whoops, the fractional interpretation in four bits of a is still equal to uh, 0 0.1000, which is still equal to um, 0 0.5 in base 10. And now let's consider a times a. I'm going to write this with the integer multiplication operator, I guess. Um, if I consider a times a, um, maybe we can agree that I'm going to get something that a times a is not actually going to fit in four bits. If I multiply, so this is the value 8 
of course, as an integer. If interpreting this as a base 2 integer, the value of a is the value 8. a times a is therefore going to equal 64 in base 10. Whereas if I think of the fractional representation of a, so if I, if I interpret a as a fraction and I multiply that fraction, I'll use a dot here because it's the, the abstract real number multiplication operator. If I multiply the fractional interpretation of a by the fractional interpretation of a, I'm supposed to get, so 1 half times 1 half is supposed to be 0 0.75 in base 10. In other words, it's supposed to equal, um, I'm supposed to end up with this bit sequence here, 0, 1, 0, 0. So notice that if I perform integer multiplication, I do not get what I want. If I multiply a times a using the bit sequence 1 followed by three zeros, I get this large, this high magnitude number, not what I expect if I multiply the fractions together. So keep that in mind. Um, if I interpret, the, if I store the fraction as a bit sequence, I can't necessarily just do regular arithmetic on the bit sequence and expect it to map on to my fractional interpretation. I may have to define my very own multiplication operation that works bit by bit if I'm not careful. But mercifully, um, there are a few benefits, like this one we just saw with addition, that I can leverage for just enough um, arithmetic operations that I don't have to do that. Okay, so first, one thing I will observe is um, if I again assume a equals, uh, maybe we'll do something a little bit more complicated here. Suppose a is 1100. Zero, zero. Well, in that case, the fractional interpretation of a uh, in four bits of 1100, well, okay, of a is 0 0.1100 uh, in base 2, uh, which would be, I guess that would be 0 0.75 in base 10. And observe that if I say, if I ask about a plus 1, well, what I'll get is a plus 1 is 1101. And if I interpret that as a fraction, so the fractional interpretation of 1101, uh, which is a plus 1, that is 0 0.1. 1101. In other words, what I've done by adding 1 to a is added 1 in the least significant position of my fractional interpretation. And I can, I can basically extrapolate from that to get these two identities. If I want to add two fractions together, it is sufficient to just add together their bit sequences, treating them as integers. Um, and the way that I can achieve that is basically by, by um, repeating this point here. Because you can observe that i plus j is basically the same as adding 1 to i over and over again. That's i plus this sort of absurd summation um, of uh, k equals 1 up to j. I just add 1 over and over again. So if I know what happens when I add 1, if that's adding um, a, a, adding 1 to the least significant position of my fractional representation, I can take this identity and just sort of generalize it in a, it's egregiously, I guess. I can generalize it egregiously, and it turns out that I get this. It turns out that I can turn that into this identity here. And this is great. This is wonderful. We shouldn't take this for granted. I know some people are watching this and saying, "Why? What, what has been the point of the last five minutes? This is really pedantic. Why do I have to talk about this? It's not always true that we have this property. If I had chosen to um, derive my fractional representation some other way, I wouldn't necessarily have this. So I do actually have to justify why this is the case. I haven't given a full proof, but hopefully you can see where I'm going with this. It turns out if I want to add together two fractional representations, it is sufficient just to perform arithmetic on their integer representations. Now, we saw a minute ago that if I want to compute a value like 0.1 in base 2 multiplied by 0.1 in base 2, which is supposed to come out to be 0.01 in base 2, and just for reference, that means 0.5 times 0.5 equals 0.25 in base 2 if we use base 10. So that's an identity of the th that, of course, I would want to hold. If I want to multiply two fractions together directly, it doesn't seem to be sufficient to multiply their integer equivalents. Because if I perform integer multiplication of 1000s, which is, of course, the binary value 8, times 1000, then I'm not going to get what I'm looking for. I'm not going to get um, this is not equal to 0100. So it's not generally true that I can just work on the integer version of the fraction and get what I want. So I can't, for multiplication, this, I, I, I actually can't derive a similar identity for multiplication. It doesn't work. What I can do, though, is derive sort of a, a half of what I want. If I want to compute um, a fraction multiplied by an integer, then, um, then I'm in luck. Uh, a fractional value times an integer um, can be computed by just multiplying the integer representation of the fraction by that integer. Uh, and I can demonstrate that 
via this representation here. So 0, 1, 0, 0, in binary, that's 4. Suppose I want to compute um, the result of this. Let, let's multiply this fraction here, 0 0.01, multiplied by 2. So this is 0 0.25 in base 10. So 0 0.25 times 2 is supposed to equal um, 0 0.1 in base 2, which is 0 0.5 in base 10. And it turns out, so notice the difference here is that I'm multiplying by an integer, not by another fraction. So if I take the fractional, if I take the, in the integer encoding of that fraction, that would be this thing here, 0, 1, 0, 0, and I multiply it in binary by this. So that would be the, in the binary representation of 2 is just 1, 0 in base Two, or if you like, if we want to do that in four bits, 0, 0, 1, 0, this is the integer 2, um, then what I get is indeed 1, 0, 0, 0, which would be um, zero. The, the fractional interpretation of uh, 1, 0, 0, 0 is 0 0.1, 0, 0, 0, which is exactly what I want. So although I am not allowed to uh, generalize integer operations to multiply two fractions by each other, I am able to multiply a fraction by an integer using only integer arithmetic on the underlying representation. Okay, yes, that was very pedantic. That was going in really far down that rabbit hole, but there it is. Now we know that this number system is going to work for our purposes. If we go back and look at the formulas we have to evaluate, we never actually have to multiply two fractions by each other. We have to add fractions together and multiply fractions fractions by integers or divide by integers and the division works the same way. So what that means is if I want to compute um, the new value of a bound, so multiplying a fractional representation by a probability or a cumulative probability. So remember that a cumulative probability in my in, in based on my, my newfound love of frequencies, a cumulative probability will actually now be equivalent to cumulative frequency divided by t. So if I would like to compute a new bound, and if we go back to some of our equations to compute new bounds, like these ones here, what I appear to need to be able to do is, okay, low is a fractional value, high minus low, okay, I'm allowed to subtract fractional values from each other. So I have a fractional value, we, we called this w in the previous lecture. I have w multiplied by this cumulative probability. The question is, can I evaluate this entire equation? Okay, well I can definitely do this addition because I can add two fractional values together. I can do this subtraction because I can subtract two fractional values, but can I do this multiplication? Can I multiply a fractional value by a cumulative probability? And the slide that I was just on is saying that the answer is in fact yes. So so here, my cumulative probability, C low, actually breaks down to be CF of um, low divided by T. So if I want to multiply by a cumulative probability, so if I want to achieve the effect of this, um, I can rewrite this in terms of integer multiplications and divisions. Because recall, this is an int and so is this. So if I want to compute um, the fractional representation of I multiplied by C low, what I could do is write it like this. So the integer representation uh, of the fraction, so i, times cf low divided by t. I'm doing multiplications by integers and divisions by integers. And that's because I could expand the right-hand side out to be instead of c low, I've got cf divided by t. So I actually can perform all of the operations I need thanks to these two identities. I can add or subtract fractions. I can multiply and divide fractions by integers, although I can't multiply and divide fractions by each other. Now I still have one more problem. It's, it seems minor and it is sort of minor, but I have to work around it somehow. So what I just said was, I'm gonna use a representation that reserves some number of bits, let's say it's gonna be four, and it interprets that as being um, the expansion after the radix point. So if I choose this, for example, that's the, the, the fraction 0 0.1111. The problem is in arithmetic coding at the very beginning, I want high to be assigned the value 1.0. Because, of course, at the beginning, my range is the entire interval 0 through 1. And at the beginning, I assign high to be 1.0. Often, it turns out that high and low end up somewhere in the middle. But in certain cases, high can remain at 1.0 for many steps. So high could stay at 1.0, and low could keep getting closer and closer to it if I keep encoding the last symbol um, in the range. So I need some way of indicating that high equals 1.0. Once high goes below 1.0, I can, I can rely on my usual representation where um, everything is 0 point something. But I need some way of representing 1.0, and I don't seem to have that because I've fixed the bit before the radix point to be a 0. Um, I've got a couple of options here. I could design some special case, like a flag that says, is high equal to 1? That's a bit clunky. I'm not going to do that. Instead, I'm going to try and find some way of getting, of achieving the desired effect while keeping um, the abstraction I already have, 0 point something.
So one observation I can make is that actually there is a way of representing 1.0 using my representation taken to a certain extreme, which is that in base 2, 1.0 is equal to this, 0 0.1 repeating, so equal to 0 0.11111 going off into infinity. This is due to the same logic that results in base 10 uh, in the fact that 1.0 equals 0 0.9 repeating. 0 0.9 repeating is 1.0. They are exactly the same number. There is no difference between them because if you try to compute the difference, you'll discover that it is zero. Um, this is a fact that people like to argue about in high school or in their first year. You're all way too smart to care or want to argue about this. You're too smart and have too many other things to do to want to argue. If you know anybody that wants to argue about whether this is true, please tell them where to find me. You know where my office is. I'd love to have that argument. Um, so we can observe that because there is a way of expressing 1.0 as 0 point something, maybe that can help us out. The problem is we don't have an infinite number of bits, as we know. We only have a finite number. So if I use a finite number of bits, if I, if I represent high as this value here, so I'm using 4 bits, for example, this is not equal to 1.0. I mean, there are values between this expansion and 1.0, for example, this value. So I can't necessarily represent um, 1.0 using a finite number of 1 bits. What I can observe, though, is that although there are values between this and 1.0, if I'm only allowed to use 4 bits, I can't represent any of those values. The only values between this number and 1.0 are values that need 5 bits or values that need 6 bits or, you know, other values that need 6 bits. So if I'm only allowed to use 4 bits or in general Q bits, this is the largest thing I can represent, the closest thing to 1.0, but it definitely isn't equal to 1.0. So here's an idea. Why do I have to store the actual upper bound? Why can't maybe instead I store a number that's close to the upper bound and tell you how to get the upper bound from it? So for example, instead of representing my interval as low up to but not including high, because recall that we're using a half open interval, where low is the smallest thing in the interval, and high is the smallest value greater than low that isn't in the interval. Um, what if I tried something like this? I will set high to be this value. It actually does equal 0 0.1111, which is not equal to 1.0. But then I'll adjust my range to say, actually, the interval goes from low up to high plus 1. Or to be really formal about it, the fractional interpretation of low up to the fractional interpretation of high plus 1. Because notice that if I add 1 to the least significant position here, I will get 1.0. So I could just move my goalposts a bit. I could store high as the best bit sequence I can get in the precision that I have and just say, look, if you want the actual upper bound, high is no longer the upper bound. High is the number as close as possible to the upper bound, but the upper bound itself is actually high all plus one. I am allowed to, it, it, that's a weird way of moving the goalposts, but I am allowed to do that. Now, I think I've gotten ahead of the slides. Um, so the interval low high is a half open interval. The value high is not in the interval, the, the high that we were using last time. There's this secondary problem, which is that open and half open intervals are really weird. Um, they're great in real analysis. If you're talking about real numbers, they're, it's easy to talk about open and half open intervals. Whenever you have a finite representation, half open intervals become a little bit weird because the, the point of a half open interval is that there are um, you can get infinitely close to this value. So if I'm looking at the interval 0 up to but not including 1, there you can get infinitely close to 1 and still be in the interval. But if you actually hit hit one, you were not in the interval. The problem with that is that getting infinitely close to a number sort of requires infinite precision, which we don't have in finite representations. So half open intervals are already a bit sketchy in a finite representation. So as a workaround to get around both of those problems, what we're going to do is set high to be this value, which means that, that high is actually not equal to 1.0 because high is represented in a finite number of bits. If I set high to be this, um, then interpreting high as a fraction gives me something that is not equal to 1.0, definitely. So I adopt the convention that in fact the upper end of the interval is the fractional interpretation of high plus 1, because the fractional interpretation of high plus 1 is equal to 1.0.
So I just add, if I add one to it, and I apply that in general. So in general, the upper end of my range is always gonna be the fractional interpretation of high plus one. So if I ever need to compute the upper end, I add one to high, which might require more bits than I'm using to store high, and then I uh, look at the fractional interpretation of that. So that's a bit weird. I hope that even if you don't like any of what I just said, it does appear as if I've explained why we do this weird step. Because in general, when I learn new things, I get really suspicious or itchy or something. There's something that really annoys me about seeing these strange steps that seem just to make things more complicated. This is not trying to torture you. This is something that we have to do. We have to have some way around this problem of needing to represent 1.0, or in general, working around just half open intervals being sort of weird. Um, okay, so notice that if we have that property, um, every binary fraction whose expansion begins with the bits in high will be in my interval, which is sort of nice for other reasons. So if high is equal to this, then we understand that the real upper bound of the interval is actually 1.0 if I'm working in four bits. So if, I'm, if I use four bits, the actual upper bound is 1.0. But that means that anything, if high is, um, if this is the fractional interpretation of high, is this value here, then any bit sequence beginning with those bits is guaranteed to be in my interval because the interval actually ends a, a little bit above the value of high. So that's one other thing to observe. Um, so yeah, if high is 1011, then the fractional interpretation of high plus one is this thing because I add one, um, so in four bits, I add one to the least significant bit and I get 1100, which equals 0.75. Every binary fraction beginning 1011 is going to be less than, than 0.75. So that's one other thing to observe is now I'm not, I don't have to be as worried about coming in explicitly below the value of high when I choose my representative. All right, so adapting all the things we've just done into our set of formulas. Um, my range, remember that my range is computed based on the idea of having a half open interval. So in the previous lecture, when I had high as the upper endpoint of a half open interval, range was defined as high minus low. But now, um, because high has been defined to be a little bit different, I have to offset the formulas that use high. So when I want the actual high endpoint of my range, I'm going to do high plus one. And you can see that happening here. Um, but on the other hand, so here down, when I compute the new value of my high endpoint, okay, the old formula to compute the new high endpoint was this. The problem is I don't actually want to store the upper endpoint of the range. I want to store that all minus one. So this weird adjustment I'm making to high involves adding one to high when I need the real upper bound and subtracting one when I've computed the new upper bound and I want to store it. So there's, there's a plus one balanced by a minus one. That's annoying, but now, now you know the formula, so you can just use it. Okay, so I want to perform encoding using 16 bits. And 16 bits isn't very many. Of course, I've got plenty more bits available on my machine. I want to show that um, we, we actually can, with this number system and a couple of other compromises, use a relatively small number of bits. The number of bits we need depends on the cumulative frequency values, and I'll talk about that later. So I'm going to use 16 bits to represent low and high. Uh, and that means that all other numerical values, like cumulative frequencies, will also be stored in 16 bits. However, although I'm using 16 bits for storage, Storage, we're going to adopt the general convention that if you use 16 bits or in general Q bits for storage, you should also use tw uh, twice as many bits for computation. So although I'm going to store low in 16 bits, any formula I evaluate using low, I'm going to use 32 bits of precision. If I then need to store the result of that computation back into low, I will truncate it down to 16 bits. So I use more precision during computations to um, avoid the truncation error getting too severe in the middle of a calculation. I guess, and also to prevent against certain forms of overflow. Okay, so at each step, I evaluate those formulas from earlier on my 16-bit values. Um, and then I encounter this problem, something I haven't yet gotten to, but something that's very important. Notice how, as earlier, even at this early stage, after one character, when I compute my new values of low and high, they share a common prefix. And I mentioned earlier that that common prefix can pile up. And if I allow the common prefix to infect the entirety of low and high, I run out of bits to use for my calculation because we know that once the common prefix is there, it's never going to change. So taking that observation and running with it, I realize, wait a minute, if the common prefix will never change, why do I need to store it? 
I know that eventually I'm going to send my decompressor this compressed bitstream. If I have a common prefix forming, why not just get rid of it? Let's just send it out to the decompressor. Let's send it to my compressed bitstream. It's never going to change. So if I see a common prefix, what I will do is, uh, if I notice that the leading bits of both new low and new high are equal, I delete them, and I delete them, we view this as a shift operation. So I shift every other bit one to the left of every, um, every bit of new low and new high. I take the prefix that I deleted and I send it out to my bitstream. So it still exists, but I'm no longer keeping it in memory. I can, I can send it out to disk or I can send it across the network or whatever. It is now part of my compressed bitstream forever. So I shift out the common prefix. Now shifting everything out means that every single bit in new low and new high moves over by one, which means I now have one free bit position. So what I'm gonna do is shift in a zero bit as the rightmost bit of low and shift in a one bit as the rightmost bit of high. Uh, and so the reason I'm shifting in a one bit into high is because if the old value of high were this, and I shift out this one, I want to shift in a new bit such that the new value of high is still the largest value possible below the true upper bound, because the true upper bound is this all plus one. Um, so for each bit shifted out of new low, I shift in a new zero bit from the right. For each uh, bit shifted out of new high, I shift in a one bit. I always shift in ones to high and zeros to low. Um, and as I go forward in compression, so here I am encoding the space character. Notice how after this step, there is a three character common prefix, a three bit common prefix. I shift out the whole thing. That means I'm shifting in three zeros into low and three ones into high. Uh, and I know that low is going to be less than high at all times. Uh, and what this shifting is guaranteeing is that if there's going to be a common prefix, the only time the common prefix can ever occur is when the leading bits of both things are equal, obviously. But the leading bits of both things will be, so they could both be zero, they could both be one. We've seen both cases show up in the last few slides. But if once the common prefix has been eliminated, it must always be the case that low begins with zero and high begins with one. Because the converse is impossible. Think about what this would mean. If I have low beginning with a one and high high beginning with a zero, that means that low is greater than high, which of course is never allowed. So that means that after I've eliminated any common prefix, low must begin with a zero and high must begin with a one. Because if low began with a one, high would also begin with a one, so I haven't finished removing my common prefix. And similarly, if both of them began with a zero. So once the common prefix is gone, low starts with zero, high starts with one. That's going to be significant later. Um, so one, one other thing I should observe is, once I'm done this shift operation, really the, the, this variable low no longer contains the true lower bound. It only contains some of the bits of the lower bound because all those bits I shifted out still exist. We're just not considering them. The real lower bound is these bits followed by all of these bits. And you can go further and say, actually, because of the way we're doing our shifting, we are sort of viewing low as being followed by an infinite sequence of zero bits and high as being followed by an infinite sequence of one bits. And we bring those one bits in with shifting as we remove the common prefix. So the true value of the lower bound after the encoding step I just finished is um, zero point this stuff the compressed bitstream, the common prefix, then the actual value of my new low, so that would be these bits here, and then an infinite number of zero bits. And these are the zero bits that we bring in as we shift stuff out. These are this infinite reservoir of zeros. Similarly, the true value of the upper bound is actually this, the bitstream, um, followed by the actual value of this, followed by an infinite sequence of one bits. Now you might stare at this and think, hey, hold on a second. Didn't we just say that the upper bound is actually this whole thing plus one? And the answer is, well, actually, strangely, yes and no. The real, the true end of the interval, the true upper bound of the interval is equal to this whole thing all plus one in the least significant position. That was the law that we stated a few slides ago. So it's true that the true upper bound is actually the bit stream followed by the current bits of high that are active, the ones I'm actually working with, and then if I add one to that, I get the true upper bound. But I'm actually going to argue that because I have an infinite number of one bits, in, at least in my imagination, I view the true upper bound as being the bit stream, the active bits, followed by an infinite number of one bits. That is equivalent to what I would get by adding one here and ignoring these. Because remember, by the same logic that 0.1 repeating equals one, it also is true that let's say 0.01 repeating is actually equal to 0.1. So I actually get the same effect both ways. That's one of the reasons why I was able to get away with just redefining um, the upper bound to be high plus one and not high. So keep that in mind. Um, I am not representing an infinite number of 
bits in a finite amount of space. What I've chosen to do essentially is design a new number system where I only store a certain set of the bits of the numbers I'm working with. The real upper bound is actually this whole thing, but I'm only storing the bits that are interesting, the bits that are likely to change. And the real lower bound is this whole thing, but I'm only storing these bits in the middle. I don't store the infinite zeros because I know that they're all there. I don't store the bit stream, at least I'm not, I don't have to store it in memory because it's never going to change. The real lower bound is this sequence of bits that never changes, these bits that I'm currently working with, and this infinite sequence of zeros. Another observation you can make about this new number system is this is not quite a fixed point system. It's a certain weird type of floating point system in a strange way because over time, the specific positions represented by low move further and further to the right. As the prefix gets larger, as I add more bits here, those bits get squashed in between the, the current bit stream and the current bits of low. So in a sense, the specific set of positions represented by this bit sequence moves around over time in a very similar way to the way floating point numbers work, but that's just a, a philosophical observation. So now the question is, okay, I've actually just said that I'm not doing traditional arithmetic here. The value of low is no longer exactly the same as a fraction beginning with zero point something. It really, new low, or these values low and high at each step, are actually a bunch of bits somewhere in the middle of a fractional expansion. Is this a problem? So, for example, if I exclude the common prefix, if I view the real lower bounds to actually include this common prefix still, isn't it true that the equations for arithmetic coding require you operating on the entire lower bound at once? So that is to say, um, this common prefix is supposed to participate in the arithmetic. Does excluding it from the arithmetic, only performing arithmetic on the bits that can change, is that going to change um, the accuracy or the correctness of the arithmetic operations? A lot of the, the, the sources I've read about arithmetic coding just do this and they say, don't worry, it's not a problem. And I feel like I owe you a little bit better of an explanation. So the answer is no. I mean, if, if the answer were yes, then I shouldn't be doing this. The answer is no, and here's why. Um, here are the operations performed on my variables low and high. It's these three, the, these three equations are what I evaluate. We think of, in the arbitrary arithmetic coding sense from the last lecture, these operations are supposed to be performed on the complete um, uh, lower bound and upper bound, so without the common prefix deleted. So for a moment, let's consider what happens if I don't delete the common prefix. If both low and high still have the common prefix included, it hasn't been shifted out, then wouldn't you agree that because the common prefix, so let's just make up a value of low and high here. So suppose, and I'll use um, for this, I guess I have to, I should use base two. So our common prefix is 0 0.1011, 0 0.1011, and then low is 0, 0101 and high is 1111. So the common prefix is this stuff here. When I go to compute lo, uh, uh, this, the range, uh, a sub-expression is high minus low. If I rewrite this, it, range is computed by high minus low all plus one. But if I compute high minus low, the common prefix cancels out. So it doesn't matter whether it's there or not. If the common prefix was all zeros or all ones or anything else, it would cancel out. So I would argue that the presence or absence of the common prefix has no bearing whatsoever on the computation of the range of high minus low. And as far as the other two formulas go, let's take a look at what they involve. So they involve, strangely, the computation for the new high only involves the old lower bound. Both of them involve the current value of low. The current value of low might contain that common prefix or the common prefix might have been wiped out. So it's either there or it isn't. If it's, but in any event, the rest of the formula doesn't use the common prefix. The rest of the formula involves this term range, but we just saw that in range, the common prefix has been canceled out, it's gone. And so that means that whether or not the common prefix is present when you start, the same prefix will be present when you're done. So if there was a common prefix when you uh, started, if you didn't delete the common prefix, so you, you didn't do the shifting that we had done, then the common prefix is still in low when you start, and and it will be a new low, completely unmodified, when you're done. Uh, and it'll, you know, it'll be in low when you start computing high, and still in new high when you're done. Um, if I delete the common prefix, it won't be in low, and then it won't be in whatever you get. So whether or not the common prefix is present or absent makes no difference. It has no bearing on any of the remaining bits. It'll either stay there, unmodified, or it will um, still continue to not be there. That's it. Um, because all of the remaining bits, the ones that are the, the, uh, the ones 
that are after the common prefix are the ones computed by this term here or this term here. And these two terms do not use the common prefix because we know that range won't contain the common prefix. Okay, so that's a bit all over the place, but my claim is this is enough to justify that whether we delete the common prefix or not, it'll have no real effect on the active bits, the bits that are able to change in low and high. Another question though is what about that whole shift business? So when I have low equal to this thing here, and then I shift away the common prefix, then apparently I'm doing this. I'm sort of interpreting low as now being this fraction. And isn't that going to have an effect? I've implicitly changed the magnitude of low and high. Does that shift affect the correctness of the arithmetic operations? Uh, and the answer is still no, of course. Um, so if we want to actually talk about what the real upper and lower bounds are in an abstract sense, so that is we want it to generalize from this visualization that I produced a few slides ago, then I suppose the true lower bound is the common prefix plus the current fractional interpretation of my variable low multiplied by the scale factor. Now, we don't care that much what the scale factor actually is. This is only an abstract explanation. But basically what I'm doing, if low is actually equal to this, and the common prefix is 1011, then the true lower bound is 0 0.1011 plus um, this, but this has been moved over a bit. It's been shifted down. It's been scaled to this, so 0101. So I just sort of drop that in right there. Um, so there's a scale factor inherent in the shifting that I'm doing. By moving position to the right, I'm actually giving undue emphasis to lower, least, less significant positions. So my claim is that this scale factor makes no difference. Um, that whether we have it or not, it makes no difference. Basically, because as long as we use the same scale factor everywhere, the scale factor just goes into every equation and falls right out again. So in this case, I'm going to call the scale factor s, and the actual scaling I do is 2 to the negative s. Um, I, I, just to move over the value of low to put it in its real place if I think of the real upper and lower bounds. Um, so that one other way of viewing this is the most significant bit of low is actually not the one right after the radix point. It's actually quite a ways down. It's, it's actually around the sth bit, depending on if you start at s at 0 or 1, the sth bit of the fractional expansion of the real lower bound. So in those three formulas where I am um, manipulating low and high, so we'll go back to this, if I look at these three formulas, it's true that yes, there could be some scale factor impacting low and high here. But my claim is that if one scale factor goes in, exactly the same scale factor comes back out again. So we could write range as being computed based on some scale of high and some scale of low. We could also write range as just being scaled by some value, so high uh, h plus 1 minus low. So the, the scale factor just comes right back out. If we, if we have scaling going in, the same scaling comes out. Similarly, yes, it's true that low could be scaled, I guess, but notice how none of the, the scale factor doesn't necessarily factor into this. Um, and there's never, or the, sorry, the same scale factor would factor into this. Uh, range is subject to all the same scaling as low and high. So all of the terms in this summation, in the right-hand side of this equation, are scaled by the same amount, which means I could also rewrite this as just 2 times negative s multiplied by the original formula free of scale factor. Factors. There's never a situation where I multiply, for example, high times low. There's never a situation where two scaled values get multiplied together. So although it's true that yes, there's an implicit scaling happening, the scaling doesn't change as a result of these formulas. Whatever scale was active when I went into the formula is the same scale active when I leave it. The only way the scale would change is if I multiply low by range or high by low, and I never do that. We actually can't do that because our fractional representation doesn't allow that. So my claim is that means that the, that the effect of scaling is also not going to be significant. Um, the values of new low and new high are subject to all the same scale factors that low and high were subjected to until I do more shifting, until I increment the scale factor myself. So okay, whatever. I, I've, I've done the shifting. I believe I've justified that this shifting procedure that I'm doing and omitting the common prefix doesn't affect the correctness of the arithmetic operations. Um, I should add that that doesn't inherently guarantee I'll always have enough precision. The shifting I was just doing, the deleting this leading bit because it can never change again, frees up more bits to be used later so that I still have a lot of bits to use during my calculation. I still have precision available. There's one other situation that can arise that can affect our precision. Um, it's called underflow. We'll talk about it in a minute. So it's, we still have one more thing to do before our method is going to work. 
Uh, so I'll complete my encoding process here. Um, and as we walk along, as you see, we, we chop out common prefixes at each step, or may maybe we skip it occasionally, but in general, over time, the bitstream keeps growing, and the number of bits we have available for active use remains close to 16. Um, there's something weird that's going to happen in a minute, though. Notice that at this step, I start with, with, with these values, and at the next step, I identify a common prefix of length 2. And for some reason, I end up dumping six bits into the bit stream. And what's actually happening there is, no, that's not magic. It turns out the algorithm is doing one other thing under the surface that I haven't told you about yet. I'd rather that the algorithm produce a correct result than, um, than necessarily tell you about all the features at once. I'm about to show you the feature that results in six bits, six bits getting output when there are only two bits in the common prefix. So if you're reviewing the slides and you see this, it's not a typo. This is the correct bit stream. I just haven't told you about the feature that's, that's resulted in this behavior. Um, okay, so I eventually finish encoding, and I finish encoding this end of message marker, but the compressed bitstream isn't done. So remember that really the, the true value of low and the true value of high, the true upper and lower bounds, are all of these bits followed by all of these bits or all of these bits. I just split up my representation of my lower bound into two places. So when I'm done encoding that end of message marker, I'm actually not done the compressed bit stream. Uh, there are still bits inside of low and high. And remember that my representative, the thing I'm sending to the decompressor, is supposed to be some number between low and high, between those two bounds. I have to send enough bits that the bit stream the decompressor gets is authentically between low and high. So this bit stream is the prefix of these two numbers. If I stop the bit stream there, the decompressor might interpret this as just being uh, followed by an infinite sequence of zero bits or something. And notice that that value, these bits followed by this, wouldn't lie between low and high. Because if I look at the value all zeros, which would be the equivalent of these bits, it would be less than low. Similarly, if I dump a bunch of one bits into the stream, that would be greater than high. So I have to add a few more bits to make sure that the representative that I send is between low and high. So I could just send all of these bits, the bits in low. This is a typo, it should just say low. I could send all of the bits in low um, as my compressed bit stream. So 0011101 and so on. It's therefore guaranteed, if I do that, send all 16 of those bits, that the compressed bit stream as a whole will be a number between the lower bound and the upper bound. However, one thing we saw in the last lecture was that we have the freedom to choose. Maybe I can send fewer bits. Maybe I could choose a number between these two things that doesn't require me to send all 16 bits. One thing I observe is because of that guarantee I mentioned earlier where after I'm done my shifting, low must begin with zero and high must begin with one. There actually is a very predictable number that will always be between low and high. If I think about the bits 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and then just a bunch of ones going on forever, that representative will always be between low and high. Low starts with a zero, so 0, 1, 1, 1 will always be greater than or equal to low. High starts with a one, so 0, 1, 1, 1 will always be less than or equal to high. So what I could do is choose as my representative 0, 1, and then an infinite sequence of 1s. And I can avoid sending an infinite sequence of 1s by telling the decompressor, hey, when I'm done sending you bits, so if I send this as my last bit, just assume that every remaining bit is a 1 bit. So if you need more bits than I've given you, assume that there's an infinite number of 1 bits available. I just have the decompressor agree to that in advance. So I know that low always starts with zero and high always starts with one. So the string zero followed by a st an infinite sequence of ones will always be a valid representative, a valid way of completing my compressed bit stream. And so what I'll do is just agree in advance with the decompressor that we interpret the bit stream as being followed by as many one bits as you need. We know the decompressor will stop decoding as soon as it hits the end of message marker. It might need a few extra bits to get there, but to avoid sending them, I'll just tell the decompressor, look, after the last bit I actually send you, interpret uh, the bit stream as having an infinite sequence of ones. And that guarantees that my representative, my representative being 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, will always, uh, I can send that by just sending only two bits, the two bits 0, 1. All right, so I have a way of choosing a representative. I have one more thing to complete my encoding process, and that's to accommodate this issue of underflow, a word I mentioned earlier, which I have not yet defined. Um, to do this, I want to show a concrete example. Um, I need a pretty artificial example to do this. So I'm going to encode this string. And notice how this string only contains the, the letter C and the end of message marker. 
I'm going to encode this message with this probability or frequency table, which as you can see contains characters that do not appear. If you want, you could pretend that this is actually just the end of a longer message that does contain A's, B's, and D's, or we could view it as purely artificial. Underflow itself does show up in practice, so in fact, this weird jump we saw several steps back is the result of underflow. So, and this was computed using a probability table, like a, a real probability table. So this does occur in practice, but for the sake of illustrating it, of showing it taken to an extreme, I'm going to have to use this contrived example. Um, okay, so let's do the encoding. Um, I'm going to, and we'll use these, this frequency table, which if you care, there it is, if you want to try and reproduce this experiment yourself. Um, as I perform the encoding, I want you to watch what's happening over here and observe that as I go forward and encode more and more characters, I'm never in a position to shift anything out because the shifting operation we saw in the last example is our ticket to um, maintaining precision. If we can keep shifting out a prefix, we can make sure there are still lots of bits available for our next operation. But watch what happens with this example. I never seem to be able to shift anything. Okay, so I walk forward, I encode more and more Cs, and in particular, notice that the leading bits are always zero and one in low and high. But watch what happens to the next few bits. Notice as I keep encoding, a pattern forms in the next few bits. Although I can't shift anything out because these two do not share a common prefix, there is a pattern that seems to be infecting the rest of the bit sequence. Low is uh, going to be zero and then a bunch of ones. High is going to be one and a bunch of zeros. And it keeps going and it gets worse and worse. And uh, we can see that over time, this pattern is wasting a lot of our bits. I've got fewer and fewer bits available to differentiate between the possible cases. Fewer and, fi fewer, and fewer bits available to maintain precision for my computation. Um, so low and high do appear to be converging to something, but not with a common prefix. Um, if we stare at this, we'll realize that low seems to be approaching the fraction um, 0 0.011111 and so on. If I keep encoding the letter C, it looks as if low is getting closer and closer. Low is going to this. And on the other hand, high is going to 0 0.1000 with a bunch of zeros trailing off. And if we stare at these, we realize that actually 0 0.1 repeating, I'll write it over here because we don't have infinite precision in general, uh, 0 0.01 all repeating, that's the same as 0 0.5. And also 0 0.10 all repeating is also equal to 0 0.5. So in fact, both low and high are actually both approaching the value 0 0.5. Low is getting there from the low end and high is getting there from above. So high started out as a number greater than 0 0.1, but these trailing values are slowly turning into zeros, which means high is getting smaller and smaller, closer and closer to 1 half. Low is slowly turning into the sequence 0 0.0 0, 1, 1, 1, 1, 1, and slowly getting closer and closer to one half from below. So they are converging. Now eventually what's going to happen um, is uh, we're going to end up with um, a resolution eventually occurring. It turns out there will eventually be a common prefix. So both low and high are approaching 0 0.5. That doesn't mean they're both going to equal 0 0.5. It likely means that eventually I encode something that puts both low and high on the same side of 0 0.5. If they're both on the same side of 0 0.5, they both either start with 0 1 1 1 or they both start with 1 0 0 0 0. So eventually they will be on the same side of 0 0.5 and they will have a common prefix. In this case, both low and high ended up being a little bit larger than 0 0.5. And once that, that conflict resolved, they end up with this huge common prefix, which can be dumped out all at once. And then I shift in a whole bunch of stuff at once. The issue is we have no way of knowing how long the problem will go on. If I had encoded 20 more C characters, I might have run out of precision here. I would have ended up in a situation where I didn't have enough bits left to differentiate among all possible cases. So it's we call this uh, arithmetic underflow. I don't have enough precision on the right-hand side to do what I want. Contrast with overflow, where I try to represent a number that's too big. Underflow is where I'm trying to represent numbers that are too small for the precision that I have. So this is called underflow, and it's a problem. We need to find some way of keeping this pattern under control, keeping it in check. So mathematically, as I mentioned a minute ago, what's happening here is the fractional representation of low and high are, are getting closer and closer to 1 over 2, 1 half. One of them is coming at it from below. One of them is coming at it from above. 
But eventually both values will end up on the same side of 0 0.5 and then they will share a common prefix. What I propose that we do in the meantime is fold up this pattern. So currently I'm losing, I guess, eight bits of low and high to this pattern. The pattern is very predictable. It's going to be ones in low and zeros in high. What I'm suggesting that we do is we just ignore them. We make a note over to the side, look, I'm saving up a pattern of length eight. And then I free up those eight bits for use elsewhere. So I do basically the same trick I do with my shifting. I omit a certain invariant part of low and high, and I just put it off to the side to save bits for later, to reserve bits for other precision. So I'm going to call that folding them up. And then I, I, of course, have to explain what I mean by folding. So we can detect underflow actually relatively easily. If when I'm done a particular encoding step, low begins with zero and high begins with one, but the next bit of low is a one and the next bit of high is zero, I have the very beginnings of underflow. I don't actually have to wait for low to be a whole bunch of ones in a row. I can just handle underflow as it starts. If I notice that low and high are both getting close to 0 0.5, even though right now they're not that close, I can already begin handling the underflow case. So if I notice that low begins 0, 1 and high begins 1, 0, then I won't be able to shift out a common prefix because there is no common prefix. Um, but what I could do is I could just say, hey, that 1, 0, this, this little underflow block, just ignore that for now. Just splice it out. So I splice low so that that one is no longer there. I just take a, b and stick it right after the first bit. And I take x, y and stick it after the first bit of high. I fold um, uh, low and high to omit this one and this zero. And then of course I make a note over on the side that I've got one underflow bit that I folded up. I've, I've folded up one underflow bit. So I use a counter to track how many of them there are. So in other words, I reduce this entire repeating pattern to the number eight over on the side. What's even nicer about that is if I use a counter, the number of underflow bits I can keep track of is huge. If I use a 32-bit int or a 16-bit int for this, I can track a whole ton of underflow bits while still keeping some bits at the end for other uses. Um, and this increases the effective precision of low and high, the same way that splicing out, that, that shifting out those common prefix bits allows me to increase the effective precision of low and high. Um, if I do this, I have now chosen to represent my lower bound and upper bound using three different things. I'm representing my lower bound using the combination of the compressed bit stream, so these, these bits here, um, the actual bits inside the variable low, which gets spread out strangely. The first bit goes here and the remaining bits go down here, as well as a bunch of bits that have been folded up with my underflow counter. So if my underflow counter is six, the true value of the lower bound is the compressed bit stream, the prefix, the first bit of low, then these six underflow bits, always one bits in low followed by the remaining bits of low and then an infinite sequence of zeros. So that's completing our puzzle from earlier. And the upper bound is the compressed bit stream, the common prefix, followed by the most significant bit of high, which will always be one, um, followed by six underflow bits, in this case all zeros, and then uh, the remaining bits of high and an infinite sequence of ones. So I'm now representing this one thing, my lower bound or my upper bound, using three different sources of data, my bit stream, my actual values low and high, and my underflow counter. Um, now the question is, uh, what happens when the underflow resolves? So if I make a pact that every time I see um, low looking like this and high looking like this, I splice out my underflow bits and increment my counter, my counter now has uh, value n. The question is, what's going to happen when the underflow resolves? So one thing I'm going to observe is that if low currently looks like this, so if, if these are the underflow bits here and low currently looks like this, we know that low is only going to get larger because the lower bound never, goes, never gets smaller and the upper bound never gets larger. The bounds get closer and closer to each other. So if this number gets larger, how would that look? Well, there are a couple of options. One, the number can get larger only down here. The magnitude can increase but not affect any of the earlier bits. So for example, if this zero changes to a one, then yes, the lower bound gets larger, but that has no effect on the underflow bits. Uh, under what circumstances can the lower bound get larger such that the underflow bits change, basically? Like, when do we worry about resolving the underflow? And I'll observe that if the number gets larger and these bits change, what I must have done is, you know, like add a one somewhere down here. If, it if I add, let's say I add a one to this, well, this carries, this becomes a zero and I carry a one. And then this becomes a zero and I carry a one. And eventually I'm carrying a one all the way down there. 
So for the lower bound to increase and resolve the underflow basically means that this bit becomes a 1 if the lower bound is increasing. And if this bit became a 1, it only could have occurred because I carried a 1 in from, from the column to the right, which means all of these would have had to roll over to 0. So if underflow resolves by the lower bound increasing, the lower bound will start with a 1 and then be followed by a bunch of zeros. On the other hand, um, if the underflow resolves because the upper bound gets smaller, well then, of course, that means that the upper bound will end up beginning with a zero once I'm done. And for the upper bound to begin with a zero, that means I did a subtraction that, that um, had to borrow from this position. If this one turns into a zero, then something I subtracted from the upper bound in an abstract sense, no matter how I evaluate that formula in general, I decremented the lower bound in such a way that this became a zero, which means I'm having to carry over all of these columns and make them all into ones. So when underflow resolves, what I'll end up with is actually something quite predictable. In general, there actually are sort of two outcomes. So one outcome is I still have underflow bits saved up and encoding ends because obviously underflow always will resolve eventually. Um, but the question is whether that's going to happen before encoding ends. Uh, well, there are weird infinite cases that I'm not going to consider. But in general, I can assume that either underflow is continuing and encoding is over, or there's going to be a very predictable resolution of underflow. If encoding ends before the underflow gets resolved, I can still recover all of the bits in my bounds because I know what they are. They're going to be my compressed bitstream, then the first bit of the lower or upper bound, then the underflow bits than the rest of the bits. So if, even if encoding ends before I figured this out, I can still reproduce my entire upper and lower bound. On the other hand, if encoding um, doesn't end before underflow resolves, if the underflow does get resolved at some point, it will always look the same way. Either the first digit of the lower bound goes to 1, and that only can happen because of a carry happening all the way from the right, which means all of these bits have to then uh, wrap around to 0. Or alternatively, the lower bound gets smaller. That means this bit becomes a 0 via what could be viewed as sort of a subtraction operation propagating from the right. And that means all of these get turned into ones. So in any event, when underflow is resolved, what I will end up with is the most significant bit changing, and then all of the remaining bits, because you, you can see at this point that either way, a common prefix now exists. So I can now get, I can expunge all of those underflow bits. Um, in any case, the bits, uh, the underflow bits will always end up being the opposite of the most significant bit when underflow resolves. So if the most significant bit is one, there will be n uh, zeros following it. If the most significant bit is zero, there will be n ones following it. Um, so in this case, the one we were looking at earlier, the underflow affects eight bits after the most significant bit. And we can fold those up. And notice that um, uh, if we resolve that underflow, when the resolution occurs, we have a one bit followed by eight zero bits uh, as the resolution to our underflow. And then we can shift those out. Um, so what we could do is just keep a counter of the number of bits that we're folding up, keep that underflow counter, and then just reproduce them, just dump them back out when it comes time to emit the common prefix. So I'll do the same encoding process again, but I'm going to keep that underflow counter uh, separate now. And that means whenever I see an underflow forming, I'm going to splice it out immediately and increment my underflow counter. Okay, so I start moving, um, and I don't yet have a common prefix of any kind. But at this step, um, notice how uh, I don't have a common prefix, but there it is. I've got that underflow stack uh, uh, forming, so 1 in low and 0 in high. So I delete it. Notice how you can, it's no longer present. Um, in when I'm done my shifting. Instead, I just moved everything over to the left and I increment my underflow counter. I save that up for later. Okay, so I keep going. Eventually, I again see that underflow stack. Okay, so I shift everything over. I increment my underflow counter. And you can try this as an exercise, but I keep doing it. And over time, I keep piling up these underflows, but they don't dominate my um, uh, encoding of low or high. I am able to retain lots of bits to work with in low and high. That's significant. Um, and eventually, underflow counter hits 8. So there it is. I pull out this underflow, and the counter goes up to 8. And I keep walking. And eventually, at some future step, I notice that the most significant bit of low and high matches. So what that means is, in the condensed representation, I guess a carry operation resulted in this being set to 1. But we know that there was, really, the value of low at the end of the previous step was actually not this. It was a 0 followed by 8 ones, 
followed by the rest of low, so 0, 1, 1, and so on. These hidden folded out 1s are still there. If a carry operation makes this into a 1, then I guess I must have the carry must have gone across all of these positions, and they therefore all have to be zeros. So it is quite predictable that uh, I can resolve, once I see the common prefix forming, I output it by just first outputting the most significant bit, there it is, then I dump out my underflow counter, I output eight zero bits, eight copies of the opposite bit of what I just output, and then I go in and output the remainder of the common prefix if it exists, so in this case, one zero zero one. So all it requires is a bit of extra logic when I uh, resolve my common prefix, so when I, after I've output the most significant bit, to then resolve the underflow, to then, to then um, uh, output uh, the opposite bit uh, underflow counter times, and then set the underflow counter back to zero. So we actually now have all the pieces we need. By folding it up and by uh, shifting out common prefixes, we can retain enough precision to be able to perform arithmetic coding. Um, even though the bit sequence can get, the bit stream can get very, very large over time and the ranges get very, very small, we're able to keep that moving window to keep the values of low and high with enough precision that we can always perform more steps. So as I mentioned earlier, it's up to you how many bits you choose to use in a case like this, but if you choose to store your values in qubits, you should be using two times qubits uh, for all arithmetic operations. So that means if you are using 32 bits to store low and high, make sure that when you perform arithmetic, you're doing it with 64 bits of precision. So you could do this by casting all the values to 64 bit ints before you actually perform the arithmetic, the addition, multiplication, or division. Uh, there's also the question of overflow. So like, what, what do I need to ensure that my probability distribution can actually fit inside of the number of bits that I'm using? Uh, I could go into detail about this, but I, I think we're out of patience. So uh, the books talk about this, but basically it turns out it's sufficient to just um, take a look at your cumulative frequency table and make sure essentially that all of the numbers in your frequency table can fit inside of the number of bits you're using. So if I'm using Q bits to represent my, my uh, values, low and high, and my frequencies, I just need to verify that all of my cumulative frequency values fit inside of Q bits. Um, I, that's even easier to do once you notice that because T, the, the um, total cumulative frequency, is the sum of all the other values, if T fits inside of Q bits, then so do all the other things. So what we basically need is T to be less than 2 to the Q, so strictly less than. In other words, T can fit inside of a Q bit representation. If you find yourself working with a frequency table where t is greater than or equal to 2 to the q, so you, you don't have the flexibility to use more bits, but t is too large, what you could do is just scale every element of the table down. Um, so you could find some divisor d such that t divided by d is less than 2 to the q and just scale all the frequencies down by dividing them by d because then the resulting table will fit inside of q bits. Now doing that, of course, introduces a certain form of truncation error because by dividing the frequencies we lose some precision in them, but the logic is if your frequency values are that large anyway, uh, maybe you already have a decent amount of granularity and you have to lose, you have, you have to sacrifice something to fit everything in the number of bits that you're using. So here is pseudocode for the encoding process. It's a little bit nasty looking, but if you stare at individual lines of it, you'll realize that just like in the last lecture, all of this is most is tedious arithmetic. I mean, uh, computing the frequency tables is pretty easy, um, and uh, the only I, I, the only real unknown is this line here, which is splicing out bits. That's just a bunch of bit. It's a bunch of annoying bitwise operations. That's it. So like last time, arithmetic coding itself is actually pretty simple in terms of what you need to do. It's how you do it. The logic it takes to actually come up with that algorithm. So all of these are arithmetic operations or bitwise operations. Um, there is the fact that you can write pseudocode out simply does not make the algorithm fast because we're operating on a bitwise level here. So we're doing doing things like for each bit. So you have to shift out bits as long as the most significant bit matches, which does require quite a bit of actual work, quite a bit of churning on the part of the processor. But nonetheless, if you write this, you have an arithmetic coder. I'm going to talk a bit about decoding. Uh, the, the decoding process is simple enough or, or similar enough to encoding that I'm not, going to going, I'm not going into great detail on that front. I just want to talk about the similarities and differences. So um, mainly to do decoding, as we know from the last lecture, the decoder moves in lockstep with the encoder. Um, so if I want to decode, I have to basically duplicate the compression logic entirely. Many of the outputs of the compression logic are irrelevant to the decoder. So for example, I don't necessarily care that much about keeping 
track of the underflow counter. I still have to splice out underflow bits because I have to I have to have my low and high exactly the same as the compressor's low and high, so that any uh, arithmetic issues, any truncation errors, are the same in the decoder as encoder. So one unspoken thing about the truncation that we're implicitly doing with our divisions in fixed point arithmetic is yes, there is truncation error, but as long as the decoder is able to produce the same set of errors as the encoder, it shouldn't be a problem. So some of the compressor's outputs are irrelevant to the decoder. So for example, when I shift out common prefixes, I don't care where they go because in decoding, I don't need them. I'm already, I already have my compressed bit stream. The other major difference in the uh, decoding step is that um, just like we saw in the last lecture, when I'm decoding, I'm using this value, I guess in the last lecture I called it V. So I have this encoded sequence. In our last lecture, we tried uh, to, to decode in base 10, this value 0 0.2020485. And the idea was V stays the same, and low and high slowly approach this value from either side. They squeeze together um, uh, towards the value of V. So we need that. We need some value that tells us our encoded representative so that we can have low and high slowly get closer and closer, and we can look at this at each step and figure out what the next symbol is. So we're not going to call it V. I'm going to call it in the pseudocode encoded. And encoded will be, of course, a base 2 uh, binary expansion of a fraction. So you know, low and high are all equal to 0 point something. Uh, and so is encoded. Now we know that low starts at 0, 0.000, and as we shift in new bits, we always shift in 0 bits. High starts at 111, and as we shift new bits in, we shift in 1 bits. Encoded is going to start with, so suppose I'm using, uh, let's use 4 bits here. Encoded will start with the first 4 bits of my compressed bit stream. So in other words, the first 4 bits that the compressor generated, these things. So encoded will be the first four bits of the compressed bit stream. And over time, I'm going to shift bits out of low and high. Any shift operation I apply to low and high, I'm also going to apply to the value encoded. When I perform the shift operation, what I'm really doing is freeing up one new position in all three values. To uh, fill in the new value of low, I use a 0. To fill in the new value of high, I use a 1. And to fill in the new value of my encoded sequence, I bring in one more bit from the encoded bit stream. So in other words, what I'm doing with this encoded bit stream is I'm pulling each bit into my value encoded. And then as a shift happens, I pull one more value in. So the shifting of the encoded bit stream works in lockstep with the shifting of low and high. And the same is true with the splicing. So if I end up in a situation where I splice a bit out of my low and high, I splice the same bit out of encoded. And one thing you can also observe about this is um, if I notice that low and high have a common prefix, so there's low and it has a common prefix with high, because I know that that the encoded bit stream must always lie between low and high, it has to be the case that any common prefix that low and high share has to be shared by my encoded sequence, which is why it makes sense just to shift that out, just to get rid of it, because it's now unchangeable, it's now irrelevant. Uh, and then finally, um, the other thing I have to adjust for this uh, setting is in the last lecture, we talked about the formula we use to figure out the next symbol. This is the same formula, but I've had to adjust it for the new numbering system that we're using. Um, so for example, you see high plus one in there. And then there's t, and I'm doing the division in a different order to try and preserve uh, precision as long as I possibly can. So at each step, I scale my value of v in the last lecture or encoded in this lecture to produce this scaled symbol value. I then look it up in my cumulative frequency table. I find a value i such that my scaled symbol value is between cf low and cf high of si. And then I once I've found that, then si is the next symbol. So once I know si, I can advance my encoding process. I I can reproduce the compression logic for one more step. Um, and then one last thing, uh, I, I mentioned uh, earlier that one trick that we use when we're choosing our representatives, so if this is our encoded bit stream at the end, I'll just generate a 0 and 1 and tell the decompressor that the encoded bit stream uh, is um, uh, followed by an infinite sequence of one bits. So due to that decision, we have to add that logic to the decompressor. So if the decompressor runs out of input bits before it's done decoding, it should assume it has an infinite reservoir of one bits available to pull from. Uh, and so I'll also point out that when you look at the pseudocode, you'll notice that although we do still splice bits out due to underflow, we do not maintain an underflow counter because that's irrelevant. We don't care about generating another compressed bit stream in the decoder. We just care about duplicating the set of decisions made by the compressor.
and there is the decoding uh, pseudocode. So again, it's actually, I think the most computationally difficult part of all of this is the one where you have to look up the next symbol, just like in the last lecture. It's a large number of tedious, but relatively computationally simple operations, but it's still not necessarily very fast. So I've mentioned before that arithmetic coding is quite a bit slower in general than prefix coding, because in prefix coding, your um, the, the hardest part is generating your encoding table, which is only dependent on how many different symbols there are, not on the length of your input. Whereas this, as I perform encoding at each step, um, I'm having to work with these values low and high, which contain residue from my previous input values, um, and because I'm doing operations at the bit level, not the byte level, which can, which can take up a lot of time. So that's arithmetic coding uh, as we can implement it. Now, what I'm going to talk about in the next lecture is um, taking is harnessing a particular uh, convenience arithmetic coding gives us, which is uh, suppose I've worked out the distribution, let's say the frequencies of a particular set of symbols. So A occurs four times, B occurs three, and C occurs, let's do 10. Now with arithmetic coding, I could generate in advance a frequency table for this, um, and I could generate probabilities or whatever. I could then use this for arithmetic coding. I could also go and generate Huffman codes. So I could generate C might get a one bit encoding, and A would get a um, two bit encoding, and B would get a, another two bit encoding. Okay. What if later I decide that I change my mind about the frequency of a symbol? So what if later I decide that, hey, you know, maybe B occurs 15 times? I don't know why I would do that, but suppose I do that. In other words, suppose that I, if we view the world through probabilities, suppose that I think that um, A has a probability of 0 0.2, B has a probability of 0 0.25, and C has a probability of 0 0.55. What if I decide later that, you know what, I actually think B's probability is a little bit higher. And we know that to do that, I would then have to adjust the probabilities of other things or something. It's true that if I made that decision and I told the decompressor what I was doing, I could rearrange my Huffman code accordingly. I could regenerate my prefix code or something. But that would take quite a while. That would be rather complicated. I'd have to rebalance my entire Huffman tree. Whereas if I want to do that with arithmetic coding, all I have to do is adjust my probability table. Now, it's still true that telling the decompressor what I'm doing is a different issue. But notice how if I want to change the value of each symbol during my encoding process, arithmetic coding with its simple table of probabilities or table of frequencies makes that relatively easy. And although our traditional entropy coding model doesn't see the point in doing that, because once I know the probability of A, why would it ever change? Maybe I could use this feature to begin bringing in other non-traditional entropy coding aspects, like maybe I begin looking for two symbol dependencies. For example, maybe I know that the previous character um, was, for example, the character T or something, and I think, you know, the probability of A might be a little bit different if I know what the previous character is. I could integrate in some context into my arithmetic coding algorithm a lot more easily than I could do into an adaptive Huffman coding or prefix coding algorithm. And that is what we're going to talk about next time.